So uh, I sent a couple of, I, I blasted out a couple of emails. You can likely expect a couple more of those email blasts from me in like the next week or so, just as we get everything sort of logistically figured out. Um, so hopefully you saw that, but if you didn't, the, um, the important piece of information for you is just that based on what we were seeing in the first week of lab, we're gonna extend lab one by one week. So the first checkout for lab one for the Monday folks, uh, the first checkout was previously going to be due this coming Monday. We're gonna give everyone an extra week for the first checkout. So this is for a couple reasons. Uh, we wanna give everyone one extra week to sort of get comfortable in lab and to parse through some of the example code and figure things out. And then it also gives me an extra week to go over some content in lectures that's relevant to that first lab. So I think it's just a good idea to give it an extra week, which means that some of the, um, some of the due dates for the subsequent labs are going to be adjusted and we'll figure out exactly what those adjustments are going to be um, and let you know, we'll figure that out shortly, but we're trying to be flexible here. So, <laughs> uh, you know, just be patient with us as we get it figured out. Um, other observations from the first week of lab, I, I have a request for a slight modification of your workflow which is when you finish with a remote desktop session, I would ask that you, you finish your session by rebooting the lab PC. When you reboot the lab PC, it'll kick you out of remote desktop, which is what you want anyway, when you're finished working. Um, but what that also does is make sure that any process that might be hogging the debugger is just terminated. Uh, a little bit of experimentation shows that this increases the reliability a little bit. Um, so if you could just try to remember to finish working by rebooting, I think that's gonna make things run a little bit more smoothly. Um, we're also going to now, for each of the scheduled lab sections, we'll make sure that there's an instructor physically in the lab, a TA or myself, just so that if anything does need to be poked or any probes need to be moved or we need to unplug and replug anything, someone will be there to do that very quickly. Um, and we're going to, starting, I think, next week, we'll set up some, I, I guess we'll call them office hours or something, just some additional lab hours where instructors will, instructors will be online. I think we'll do this on Friday afternoons, probably. Um, and the idea is just for those of you that want to work ahead in advance of your uh, lab sections the coming week, we want to have a few hours where you can get feedback from instructors, you know, so that you're more prepared in the coming week. Um, so we're just trying to help folks work ahead if they want to work ahead. Any questions? And please submit, if you haven't already, please submit your group preferences uh, today. I think I have almost everyone's group preferences, but if you haven't done that yet, please submit those today. Any logistical questions from anyone? Okay, so in that case, uh, I wanna continue the discussion that we started last time, which was, and I'll just briefly remind you sort of what we were talking about. So last time we started with just a general hardware software overview of the PIC32. And we did that by talking through, at a very high level, talking through a lot of the internal hardware that's available for you to use on the PIC32. And then we started discussing plib, which is the C library that we use to configure and control this internal hardware. And I think the best way to talk about the interaction between plib and this hardware and, and to talk about protothreads is to look at examples. So the specific example that we were using to introduce this relationship between the hardware and plib and to introduce protothreads was the example code that all of you uh, got up and running in the first week in lab. So what I wanna to do today is continue the discussion of that example code. Um, and I'll remind you where we terminated that discussion last time. So this, these are all the files that you all downloaded in lab and opened up in MP Lab X to program the PIC32. Last time we took a look at this config file, which I'll just briefly remind you is where we included plib, where we included uh, standard IO, and then where we had a, a bunch of compiler directives that just set up the internal clock in the PIC32, set up the phase lock loop to turn the internal clock up from eight megahertz to 40 megahertz, 
and then turned off a few options to free up IO ports so that we could use them for our projects. And then the only other thing that happened in this file were we defined some, um, some variables so that we could use things like the system clock rate elsewhere in the code easily. So we just set sys clock equal to 40 million, 40 megahertz. And we set another variable called uh, PB clock or bus clock, which is also set to 40 megahertz. Um, and then the only, the only other thing that's happening in this file is we pound define use UART serial. We'll see today where this appears elsewhere in, this, in the code. In the proto threads header file, there's a, uh, it, it looks whether or not this is defined and if it is defined, it sets up the IO ports for UART communication. If it's not defined, then it doesn't do that so that you could use those IO ports for, for other things. As I mentioned last time, because we're gonna be interacting with all of our labs this semester through that Python interface, which communicates over UART, this will be not commented out. It will be commented in, uh, in all of your projects this semester. And then lastly is the baud rate, which is something that you're just gonna to wanna to check every lab to make sure that the baud rate that you've specified here agrees with the baud rate that you've specified in the Python code running on the lab PC, which we'll walk through today if we have time. Uh, and if we don't have time, then we'll walk through that on Monday. Okay. So after going through this, the next file that I wanna look at is the one that contains uh, main, which is the CCAB Python target version four. And I wanna start our discussion of, so I, so I imagine many of you are familiar with this, but just in case this is newer content to some of you, um, the reason that it makes sense to start a discussion of a project with the file that contains main is when, when the program starts running, when you click reset on the PIC32, your code starts getting executed at the function called main. So the first line of your code that runs is the first line in the function called main in your project. So each of your projects will have exactly one function called main and that name is special. Um, that is the function where execution begins. So it's sort of the logical place to start a discussion of a project is with the file that contains that function and actually with that function itself. So that is down at the bottom of this file. Before I scroll down to look at that, I just wanna point out a few of the includes that we're bringing in here. You can see the first thing that we're including is that config file that we've been looking at, right? And I'm pointing this out because you'll recall that in that config file, this is where plib is brought in and standard IO. So the reason that you don't see plib and standard IO being pound included in this file is because it's included in the one that we're including here. It's included in the config file. The other thing that we're including is this pt cornell 132 python.h. This is uh, the header file that defines all of the proto threads macros that we'll be using to set up our threaded program. And We'll take a look at this next. I wanna sort of stick to one level of abstraction at a time. So I wanna consider this file and then we can pop down a level of abstraction and take a look at how ProtoThreads works a little bit. Um, we're including the standard math library just because we wanna do some math. In this particular file, we're building some sign tables that we use for direct digital synthesis. Things like sine and cosine come from math.h, so we include that. And then the only other thing that we're including, which you will likely want to include in all of your files are two header files um, associated with the TFT display screen. So TFT master.h and TFT gfx.h. We can talk through those in detail if that's useful. If you, if you glance through them yourself, you'll find that they're very well commented. And all that these include are a bunch of, um, a bunch of functions for allow, that allow for you to do very sort of basic computer graphic stuff with the TFT display screen. So draw circles, draw lines, write text, draw squares and rectangles and stuff like that. All the sorts of basic shapes and capabilities that you would use to do something interesting in your project with the TFT display screen or to use it for debugging. And as we go through this, this uh, this file here, we'll see some examples of function calls from these TFT header libraries, okay? What I wanna do next is scroll past what looks like a terrifying amount of code 
uh, down to Maine. What I'm scrolling past as I scroll past it is basically a bunch of threads. And what we're going to see today is one of the benefits of, of setting your software up with something like a threader is it's highly, highly modular. So once you know how to create and schedule a single thread, it's relatively simple to add more threads. So it looks like it's going to look like I'm scrolling past a lot of code. Most of that code, once you understand one little chunk of it, you understand a whole bunch of the rest of the chunks of it, right? Um, so I'm scrolling past a number of threads, and I'm also scrolling past an interrupt service routine that we'll talk about in more detail today if we have time, and if not today, then next week when we're talking about direct digital synthesis. But we include some stuff, define some variables that we'll talk about in more detail, and then the next thing that I want to take a look at is main, which is down here at the bottom. So as I mentioned, what is special about main is that this is where execution begins. So the first, the first of your code that runs is the code that is contained here within main and it starts at the top and then goes to the bottom. So I wanna just walk through this essentially one line at a time and talk about what each of these lines is doing and use these as uh, opportunities to talk about plib and to point out how we're using plib to configure various hardware peripherals. So the first thing that we do within main is pound define this variable that we're calling timeout. We'll talk more about precisely what's going on here next week when we do a discussion of uh, direct digital synthesis. But all that we're doing is setting this variable timeout to a quantity that's equal to the system clock rate, 40 million, divided by a variable that's defined up above FS, this is the audio sample rate, which for this particular project, we're using an audio sample rate of 48 kilohertz. Um, we're going to use this then when we're opening and configuring a timer and a timer interrupt. So let, let, me, let me talk about opening the timer and then I'll talk about why this particular value is what it is. But this open timer two is the first example of a call to a plib defined function that we see. And all that this is doing is opening a particular timer and configuring it. So I mentioned that there are five timers on the PIC32, timers one, two, three, four, and five. Timer one is being used by the threader. So you don't wanna use that one, but timers two, three, four, and five are available for you to use in your projects. And in this project, we're using timer two. So we open timer two with a series of flags that just set up some configurations. Um, the first flag here just turns on the timer. The second flag says, use the internal clock for this timer. The third flag sets the prescaler. In this case, we're setting the prescaler to one, which is just to say we want for this timer to, to iterate every CPU cycle. So every time the CPU clicks, we want for the timer to increment by one. If we set this to a prescaler value of four, then every four CPU cycles, the timer would increment by one. So by increasing this prescaler, you can essentially increase the period of this timer. And then we set the timeout value of the timer equal to this value. So this is saying that we want for this timer to overflow every time it counts up to the value of timeout, which it turns out is 40 million divided by 48,000, which is something like 909. So this is going to count up to 909 and overflow. The next thing that happens here is we're telling, we're telling our program what to do when that timer overflows. And what we wanna do every time this timer overflows is throw an interrupt and enter an interrupt service routine. What we're using this timer to do in this program is send audio samples to the DAC. And we wanna send a new audio sample to the DAC at a very, very precise rate at precisely 48 kilohertz. So at precisely 48 kilohertz, every 48 kilohertz, we wanna send a new audio sample to the DAC to produce a sound. It turns out with audio synthesis, it's important to be precise with this sort of timing. And any time that you need to be precise with timing, you wanna use a timer interrupt as opposed to doing something like, um, using millisecond delays in proto threads or something like that. The, the, the proto threads timing is good to 
oh gosh, I don't know, maybe a couple of milliseconds. What do you think, Bruce? Well, since it's a cooperative scheduler, you can't actually bound the accuracy because if another thread hogs the CPU you're, and you had the synthesis in a thread, your, your, synthesis would, your audio synthesis would just die. Whereas nothing interrupts an interrupt, so to speak. So if you care about precise timing and in audio synthesis, you do, then you want to do that timing with an, a, a timer interrupt. So that's what we're configuring here. We've opened timer two, and now we're configuring the interrupt associated with timer two. And all that we're saying here is that we're turning the timer two interrupt on, and we're setting it to a priority level of two. You can have your interrupts have various different priorities. Um, and, and we've chosen a priority level of two here. And then the next thing that we do immediately after is clear the interrupt flag. This is important to note. On this architecture, the interrupt flag is not cleared automatically. So every time that flag gets thrown, every time the timer overflows and the, the interrupt flag asserts, it's up to you as the programmer to then clear that interrupt flag. So when we look at the interrupt service routine, you'll see that one of the first lines in that interrupt service routine is to clear the interrupt flag. If you forget to do this, the symptom will be re-entering that interrupt service routine as fast as the CPU can manage. So it's just going to interrupt, 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 and, and chew up all of your CPU time. So you have to remember to clear this interrupt flag. And if you see a symptom that looks like that, check, check that you clear the, interrupts, uh, the interrupt flag. And we're going to look at that interrupt service routine uh, in a moment. By the way, so what's another potential bug? Suppose you open, suppose you open an interrupt and you forget to write the interrupt service routine for that interrupt, right? So here we've opened an interrupt on timer two. We've opened the timer two interrupt. We've cleared the interrupt flag. Now, suppose that we forgot to actually write an interrupt service routine associated with that interrupt vector. The symptom of that is going to be the CPU resets over and over and over again very, very quickly. What you might actually detect, as, what, what you might actually interpret as being the symptom is my TFT display isn't working or something like this. Um, so if you create an interrupt, if you turn an interrupt on, make sure that you have an associated interrupt service routine or else your CPU is just gonna reset over and over and over again. Okay. The next thing that we have here is a few more plib calls. So what we're doing in this case is we are setting um, a particular IO port as a digital output. In this case, we're setting port B bit four. So pin B four, and we'll look at the pin diagram in a moment to clarify exactly what that means. But we're setting a particular IO port as a digital output. And then we're making the, the, the voltage on that digital output high. The way that we're actually going to use this particular IO port in this particular program is as a chip select line. As I mentioned a little bit, uh, I think in a previous lecture, we communicate with the DAC over an SPI channel, a serial peripheral interface. And we're gonna dedicate a lecture sometime next week to talking through SPI protocol in, a, in, in quite a bit of detail. But for the time being, uh, I'll just say that the way that SPI communication works is there's a clock line, there's two data lines. One sends data from the, the master to the slave device, the other sends data from the slave to the master device. And then there's a chip select line, which is what we're configuring this particular IO port to be. The chip select line is how you tell a particular device on the SPI bus that you're talking to, to that particular device. And you do it by pulling the voltage on that chip select line low during the transaction. And then when you finish with the transaction, you set it high. So when we take a look at the interrupt service routine where we're actually doing SPI transactions, what we'll see is before the transaction begins, we pull this particular IO port low, which signals the start of a transaction to the DAC. We do all of the SPI communication, wait for it to finish, and then we put it high again. 
And there, if we had multiple devices on this SPI channel, we would have a different chip select line going to each device so that we could say, I'm talking to you or you or you. Talk about this in more detail in the SPI lecture, but that's, that's what's going on here. Setting up an IO port as a digital output and then setting its value to high. The next thing that we do, okay. So the next thing that we do is we wanna configure a cup, one of the other lines on that SPI channel. Um, in particular, we're configuring which IO port we wanna use for the data line on this SPI channel. Um, we're gonna use SPI channel two. So the signal name that we're trying to map to an IO port is SDO2, which is the master out slave in line. And we're doing this with this obscure looking function call called PPS output. Um, this PPS output, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna pull up some documentation to clarify this in a moment. But what we're doing here is we're saying, we want to map the signal name SDO2 to pin IO port RPB5, which is in group two on the PIC32. And you go, oh my God, like, <laughs> that's so obscure. Uh, but it, so what this is doing is it's the, this, this peripheral pin select, uh, uh, what this allows for you to do is, well, let me just show you. This is easiest if I show you. So like with almost all microcontrollers, there, there are a few levels of abstraction between IO port and signal. Right? This is true of almost all architectures. And it takes a little bit of work and it often requires that you have a few data sheets of some sort up that you can refer to, to do the mapping of signal name to IO port. So what I wanna show you is what information you need to have up in order to do these mappings. So I'm gonna to go to the course website to the IO page. And the first thing that you'll see on this web page here at the top is sort of a top-down schematic view of the microcontroller with all of the pins numbered here. So pins one through 28. And then to the left and right of each of these pins is a list of signal names attached to that pin, right? So each pin can be used for a number of different purposes. And there's particular hardware attached to particular IO pins. You can't, you can't assign a signal to an arbitrary IO pin. It can be attached to one or a handful of them. And the exercise is figuring out which one or which selection of IO ports can I map a particular signal name to. So if we take a look at this, we'll just take a look at, oh, I don't know, RPB, uh, three here as an example. So pin number seven on the PIC32 has the name RPB3. So this is port B pin three. So if we're, if we're doing something like we saw in the code here, where we were mapping a particular, we were making a particular pin a digital output. In this case, we were mapping port B bit four to a digital output. Port B bit four is actually pin 11. Right, so that's how you can see sort of the relationship between pin name and pin number. And then also listed here are a series of the other hardware peripherals that are attached to this pin. So if we look at RPB3 as an example, another thing that's attached to this pin is analog input five. So there's an analog, you could, there's an analog to digital converter attached to this pin that you can use. And if you wanna use this particular one, you would use analog to digital converter five, AN5. There's a few other things. There's a, uh, a one of the clock lines for an I squared C communication protocol. We could use this pin for that, for I2C channel two. Um, there's a real time clock hardware peripheral attached to this. Um, and a few other devices. These are what, comparator inputs, I believe, yeah. So this is input one to comparator A or input A to comparator one rather, and this is input C to comparator two. So this is showing you the relationship between some, some of these hardware peripherals, which only go to one IO port that is represented here. 
But if we take a look at this diagram, what you won't see is the signal name that we're actually mapping here in Maine, which is SDO2, right? We can look through this and SDO2 is not on this diagram. The reason for that is this is one of the signals that is controlled by peripheral pin select. So if we open up the peripheral pin select output table. Okay, so what this is showing you is on the, on the left side of this diagram is a whole bunch of pin names. And on the right side of this diagram is a whole bunch of signal names. And they are organized into four groups. Each of these groups contains eight pins. The way to interpret this diagram is if you are interested in mapping a particular signal name to, a part, to, a part, to an IO port, then you would look at the right side of this diagram and find that signal name, SDO2 in our case. This is the signal that we want to map. Through peripheral pin select, we can map this signal to any one of these eight IO ports. So we could map SDO2 to RPA1, RPB5, RPB1, RPB11, RPB8, et cetera, et cetera. In our case, we're actually mapping it to, oh, SDO2 also appears in this group. Okay, so we can map it to any of these as well. In our case, we're mapping it to RPB5, which is where? Here, right? So RPB5 is in group two. So we're gonna map this signal name to the IO port RPB5. What's actually going on here, the reason that there are eight signals associated or that there are eight pins associated with this group of signals is these pins are attached to eight way multiplexers. So you can multiplex one of these signals to a particular one of these eight IO ports. And what peripheral, what peripheral pin select is doing is configuring that multiplexer. You're telling it which of these eight possible IO ports do I want for this signal to be mapped to. So this is, it's, there are a few layers that you have to dig through here, right? In order to do this mapping. But once you get a feel for it, what's nice about this is it's highly configurable. Right? So if you're doing a particular project and um, you have some pins that are, cons that, that are necessarily consumed by some hardware peripherals, this is allowing you to map signals to a whole library of potential pins. Maybe it's important for a particular signal to be physically located on one side of your project or the other. Right? This might allow you to do that. Like maybe you want to isolate a particular analog input from some data bus or something like this. You wanna physically separate them. This allows you to choose where physically you want to interface some device with the PIC32. It's nice. It just takes a little bit of squinting at, uh, but, but what, once you get it figured out, it's, it's actually a really nice feature. It makes things really configurable. Um, I have a quick question. What are the uh, two columns like to the right of the port pin? What are those specifying? So these are, oh gosh. I'm not gonna be able to give you a good answer. Bruce, can you give a good answer? Not a very good answer, except to say that they are part of the internal multiplexer structure. And you really don't need to know how those operate. All you need to do is know the port pin and the signal name, which by the way, are re the, the order left and right is reversed for the inputs. But, we'll look at that in a second. Yeah. yeah. So if we look at this table and then look back at the line of code that we were actually considering, what this is saying is I wanna map signal name SDO2 to RPB5, which is in group two signal name SDO2 to RPB5, which is in group two. So that's setting up, it, it's, it, we're doing hardware configuration. We're using PLIB to configure the hardware that's available to us in the PIC32. And we're configuring it such that um, that data line for this SPI channel is mapped to that particular pin so that we can physically plug the DAC with wires into that IO port and communicate with it. That's the idea. So these pins expose your project to 
the world, right? That's through these pins that you interface it with sensors and actuators and everything. And we've mapped this signal to that particular pin. Um, so this is the output table. This is for signals that are output from the PIC. As you might expect, there's also an input table. Um, sorry, real quick, another question I have is, yeah. is there like a list somewhere that explains like what each of those signals are? So like, I don't know like what SDO2 means just from the letters. Like, is there somewhere that explains what that is? Go to the hardware manual, which is linked just below the labs. And every different peripheral has its own description. So if you, yeah, if you go there, you'll see that SPI is section 23. You go there, it will tell you more than you ever want to know about the SPI. Awesome, thank you. And and uh, yeah, I, I'll tell you, this is the, when you really want to figure out how stuff works on the chip. This is the this is the document you read. And my my way of doing it, and probably yours is too, is you read for a while. You say, I have no idea what's going on. I'm going to write a program. You write the program. You see what happens. You go back, and read some more, program some more, read some more and slowly iterate until you understand it. So let's go back to the IO page. And I just wanna show you where the uh, PPS input table is, which is similar in a lot of ways, right? Uh, in this case, we have our signal names over here on the left side and then the IO ports to which you can map these signal names on the left. But it's the same sort of process. The only difference as Bruce mentioned, being that in the PPS output function call, we go group pin signal. For PPS input function calls, you go group signal pin. Just something to be careful of. Okay. So with this configured, the next thing that we do is open the SPI channel. So we, we make another PLIB function call, which is SPI channel open. And then we have a bunch of flags that we use to open this with particular configurations. Um, so in this case, we're opening SPI channel two. We're turning it, we're turning the SPI channel on. We're setting it into 16 bit transfer mode. You might alternatively set this to some other number of bits to transfer. Um, the configuration that you choose here depends what the data sheet for the device that you're trying to communicate with tells you you should put there. So the DAC expects 16 bit data transfers. So we configure this to 16 bit mode. Um, we open the SPI channel in master mode. So this is master enabled because we want the PIC32 to be controlling the bus. And then these last two configurations select the, uh, they configure the, this will become clear during the SPI lecture, but um, you can configure the relationship between the data lines and the clock line. Do you want the data to be valid when the clock is high or low? And in what, what phase do you want for the data to have relative to the clock? Turns out there are four options. And unfortunately, different manufacturers of SPI devices just kind of pick one. At least I can't find any pattern. So you have to read the data sheet and figure out what's the particular configuration that's required in order to talk to the device that you want to talk to. Um, or alternatively, you do an exhaustive search because there are only four options and sometimes just try and three or four options to see which one works can be the fastest route. Um, but because, as you might expect, because you can have multiple devices on the same SPI bus, and because those devices might have different um, modes, these configurations can be configured in real time, dynamically. You can change you know, some, of the, some of the settings for this SPI channel so that you can communicate with different devices, but you have to go through the, a little bit of extra footwork just to do those changes so that you can communicate with one device than the other. <laughs> 
Um, another question is, is there also a list of these functions in that hardware manual? Because I noticed that like some of the inputs are like ORed together, like these are probably what like bit defined. Yes, there are. So like, yeah. So you can look at the, the PLIB reference manual, which is, which is quite good. Okay. Or alternatively, this is a good trick to know. So here I have, uh, this is exactly the same file that we were just looking at, just open in the MPLABX environment. So, and this is the line that we were just considering. If you write, if, if you're curious about some function, if you right click that function, go to navigate, go to declaration or definition, this will open the PLIB file where this function is defined. And the source code for PLIB is wonderfully commented. So if we scroll up a little bit here, okay, we're looking at the SPI channel open function. And these are the comments associated with this function. So it tells you its name, of course, and the arguments to it, all of the inputs, gives you an overview of the function, some notes, and then examples of how to use it. And if you scroll up a little farther in this document, you can find all of these uh, masks commented extremely with a lot of clarity, right? So if you're trying to understand what any of those flags mean, right click and, and go to declaration and definition. And you can see things like, if you were curious what open MSTEN means, well, here it tells you that it's setting the master mode. Um, here you can set it to eight bit mode, 16 bit mode, 32 bit mode. Uh, you can set it in uh, framed mode. We'll talk about this in a later lecture but this essentially automates that chip, chip select line so that you don't have to manually toggle it. So, so you can check, to answer your question, um, the PLIB reference manual and or the PLIB source code. You could look at both. Okay. Also the, the MPLABX help menu has a, 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 a yet another copy of the of the, uh, uh, if you go to help contents, I think it has sooner or later after it look after it builds the contents for you. Um, if you scroll down to the uh, C C32 tool chain down near the bottom, um, there's uh, peripheral libraries. So let's just look at SPI. And uh, yeah, so if we want to look at SPI channel open. So another place that you could look. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Uh, anything else I wanted to say about this? Any other questions about this stuff so oh, far? Last parameter, the two. Uh, this is one of its clock polarity and clock phase. This is this is represents some mode in which this is opening. I think that's controlling clock phase, if I recall. So I think the the the, the phases are part of the that open clock reverse. The two is actually uh, the divider. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, you're exactly yeah. right, as as described here. And the reason in this case for a divider of two is that the specific DAC I happened to choose years ago runs only as fast as 20 megahertz. So on the 40 megahertz bus, you have to divide by two. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. So uh, what are we using the specific SPI port to communicate with? So in this case, we're communicating, we're using the SPI channel to communicate from the PIC32 to the DAC, the digital to analog. Okay. Digital to analog. Oh, okay, okay. And we're communicating with it through the SPI channel. Got it. And is that the reason we're not setting any, uh, so uh, the PPS output function that we use we're using that uh, as the master out slave input channel on the PIC32. 
Yes. And since it's a DAC, we're not we don't need to set up a master and slave out. Is that correct? That's exactly correct. That's exactly okay. correct. Thank you. So, so to clarify um, what, what was just said for anyone that might have missed it, the reason that we're not configuring the input in this channel using that PPS input call is because we are only communicating data to the deck and we don't actually care about data coming from the deck, so we don't set it up. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, is the DAC the only other uh, only slave on that particular SPI channel? On this SPI channel, um, the only other slave on this channel is one that we're not going to be using in this class, which is the port expander. Um, okay. So there's a port expander on there so that it, in an ordinary semester for student projects, you'd have more IO ports available. We're not using that for any of our labs. So effectively, this is the only thing on this channel. On the other SPI channel is the TFT display screen. Got it. So where do we, uh, have we already initialized the chip select bit for, uh, for, the, for the DAC uh, pulled low? Did we pull it low somewhere? If I, I'm not sure if I missed it. So we will, we've configured the chip select line. Uh, we've set it high here during the initialization. Okay. Okay. When we're ready to send a transmission, we'll pull it low, transmit, and then put it high again. So we will, we will wait to pull this low until we're actually sending data to the DAC. And we do that in the interrupt service routine up above, which uh, we'll get to. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, real quick, Hunter. So you mentioned that you also in your like interrupt service routines, you clear the interrupt flag. Is there a reason why you would do it twice? So we clear it initially. To, so, uh, so once we configure this, this interrupt, we clear it initially. And then every subsequent time that it fires, we clear it. And we clear it in the interrupt service routine. Oh, got it, got it. Yeah. So this is make sure it's sort of off to start. And then every time it turns on, we turn it off again. OK, other questions? If not, I'll just continue sort of walking through main here and then we'll get into the other parts of the program. Um, the next thing that happens here, I'm gonna save the details of this for our um, direct digital synthesis talk, but what we're doing here is filling some arrays with sign tables. So we're just calculating sign values and filling some, some arrays in memory with those sign values so that we can later use that for sound synthesis. And we're going to talk about this in detail in the direct digital synthesis lab. And then importantly, uh, we set up system-wide interrupts, which is to say we turn interrupts on. If you forget to do this, um, this the scheduler, the threading, the threader requires interrupts in order to work. So if you forget to turn on interrupts, the symptom will be essentially nothing works. The scheduler won't work. It just nothing will run. Um, so this needs to be, you need to make sure that you're remembering to turn on interrupts. Okay. And, and the reason for having you do that, rather than just putting that in the threader header, threader header, I like it. it, it rather than just putting it in the threader header is that you should turn on all of the interrupts, enable all the interrupts before you initialize the master flag. And you had to, you, in this case, you had to initialize a timer interrupt. The next thing that happens is we have a series of function calls, all starting with TFT, suggesting correctly that these are all defined in those TFT libraries that we imported at the top. So this is calling a TFT init, we can take a look at this if you all would like. This is doing some behind the scenes, just configuring the TFT display screen. A TFT to begin is doing something similar. And then we call TFT fill screen and set it to black. This ILI9340 underscore black. If you look into the TFT header files, there are a series of, um, TFT takes I believe 16 bit RGB color. There's a series of these colors that are just defined for you. So that if you just want to say like green, red, et cetera, 
you don't necessarily have to go figure out the RGB values. There's a few that are predefined that you can use. And then we set the rotation of the TFT display screen to one, which is just to say, if we're talking about a particular coordinate on the TF, a particular pixel on the TFT display, we'll talk about it in terms of its X and Y coordinate. And depending on uh, which direction on the TFT display screen you consider up, then a particular coordinate will map to different pixels depending on the orientation. So this is just to say, you know, I want rotation one, whatever that means. But essentially, there are four possible rotations. It can be uh, landscape this way, portrait this way, landscape upside down, or portrait upside down, right? And if it's in the wrong orientation, then change this one to, you know, zero, one, two, or three until you get the orientation that you prefer. And then the last thing that happens here in main is we set up the threader. The first thing that we do is call PT setup. We can take a look at this in a moment if you would like, but this is doing some behind the scenes uh, setting up of the threader. Things like, um, things like setting up the UART IO ports and, and these sorts of things that all sort of happen behind the scenes. When you call PT setup, this is doing some behind the scenes stuff to set up the threader. We'll look at it in detail later, but I wanna sort of stick to this level of abstraction for now. We add a bunch of threads to our threader. All of these threads, the, their implementations are farther up in this code, All right? So if we scroll up just a little bit to glance, we can see there's a particular thread here called proto thread serial. And we add proto thread serial to the threader here. If we don't do this, then that thread never gets scheduled. Right? So we tell the threader which of our threads that we've defined up above we'd like to schedule. We initialize the scheduler. We configure it to use a round robin scheduling. All that this is saying is that the method that the scheduler will use to decide which thread to run next is, it will start with the first thread and say, are you ready to run? And if the answer is yes, then it'll run. If the answer is no, then it goes to the next thread and says, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And it'll loop through them. And when it finds one that says, I'm ready to run, then that thread will run until it yields. And then it'll start looping through those threads again and, and asking again if the next one's ready. It's round robin scheduling. And then this function call is what starts the threader. So it's the last thing that happens here in main. And once we call this, what the CPU then starts doing, or what the threader starts doing is scheduling these various threads uh, so that they can share the CPU. And exactly how they do that is up to you as the developer. You decide when one yields to another and you make sure that they all play safely together. So that's main. We're gonna continue this discussion next time and talk in some more detail about these threads up here but I think you'll find that they're not tremendously mysterious. And once we develop a decent understanding of one, the modular nature of this threading environment makes it such that adding more is um, not easy, but not outrageously difficult.